I love when a great plan comes together. You have no idea. So with that, I want to officially welcome, for the first time, right here on Y103.3, uh, the ambassador to Barbados, and of course, some other Eastern Caribbean uh, territories, um, Linda Tagliatella. How are you doing? First of all, be honest, did I pronounce that correctly? Tagliatella. Tag, tag, so I do pronounce the G then? You can, or you can say Tagliatella. Tag. Do it again for me. Talia Latella. Talia, Talia Latella. It's the Italian pronunciation. Ah. But for those, it's just, it's very phonetic. Taglia Latella. Taglia Latella. I was really unsure about the G, so I was like, is it like lasagna where it's there, but you don't really acknowledge it? In or? Italian, they don't say Gs. They don't say Gs. That's what I thought, right? Yes. So I said, well, this is an Italian name. What do I do? What do I do? I was stuck. <laughs> so th- thank you automatically for the phonetic uh, lesson first thing in the morning, and welcome again. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so and much. good morning to the listening audience. Absolutely. It's a great morning, too. Beautiful outside. And we actually had occasion to meet. I think I've seen you at a number of things before, but from a distance, like film festivals and other occasions that you might have been there. I think you said that you saw me moderate something once, so you must have been there as well. But when we first got to shake hands, uh, make acquaintance, it was at Girlfriends Expo. That was a wonderful event. I was really happy to be able to go. I have always been a big proponent of playing forward and helping young people in their careers, regardless of what it is. And to be able to go to the expo and see so many young women who are trying to engage in a business. Um, Some of them have been involved longer than others. Some are just getting started. And being able to share their stories with me was truly a phenomenal um, opportunity for me. And then I did sit in on a panel you hosted with a group of female entrepreneurs who I would say are very successful in what they do. But it was interesting because they had multiple th- talents. There were was a young lady who makes beautiful necklaces who was also a dancer. Um, so I was truly impressed with the amount of talent out there. Uh, And I think it's a great opportunity for young people to be able to look at the opportunities and develop a business if that's their life dream. Now, as an ambassador, clearly you would have your mandate from your home country, the United States of America, and you have certain diplomatic requirements whatever, wherever you are posted in whatever capacity. But do you ever bring with you a personal mantra, something that's personal to you that you would like to be able to affect once you get there? Um, As I've said You know, one of the things, I have had an amazing career. I've actually had an amazing life. I had a wonderful childhood. Um, I grew up in middle-class America with four siblings. Um, Obviously, there were sibling rivalries, but my parents took very good care of all of us, and they worked very hard to put us through school. And then when I went to work in the federal government, I've obviously been very successful. Very few people get to be an American ambassador, and I am truly privileged and proud to be one. But I think the thing that has always amazed me is that we do owe it to give back, to provide some kind of mentorship, training, assistance. So one of the things I have done throughout my career is mentor young women who come to the State Department or who are daughters of friends or whatever who are looking for career advice. And I find here working with young people to be very fulfilling, being able to sit down and talk to them about how do you define your dreams, how do you determine what you really have a passion for, and how do you make it work for you. And it doesn't sound like a small task. That's the thing, because it's not a cookie-cutter answer from one territory to another or even one individual to another. But there are some things that you would have learned along the way that you would have found particularly helpful. You know, one of the things... Um, I tell anybody, and I have actually counseled employees to leave the government or to move out of the particular job they're in, but you have to have a passion about what you're doing. You know, I, I realized very early on that we get up in the morning, we spend eight to ten hours either commuting and or working, and then we go home, and that's the biggest part of your day. So if you're not excited about what you're doing, you're not going to be a good employee, you're not going to be good at what you're doing, so you need to find your passion. You also need to understand that you don't start at the top. Everybody starts at the bottom. And as I tell people, if you're in an office and people have you Xeroxing pieces of paper or looking up things on the Internet, knowledge is powerful. So while you're Xeroxing, read what you're Xeroxing. Develop your knowledge base. Um, The more information you have, the more valuable you become to your employer. 
I will also tell you that if somebody has a problem or a question, don't give them a short answer of no, but sit down and try to ex- understand what it is they're doing and what it is they really want to know. I have a lot of people who ask questions. When I was back in Washington, I was in human resources, and they would ask a question. And the more I probed, the more I found out that the question really was not what they wanted to know, but they thought that was the question to ask. So probe into what somebody wants or how to work with somebody because the more questions you ask the more you can be of better assistance to them because you have you can hone in on what's really on their mind so is human resources your background would you say um no my background is in i'm an analyst at heart oh. i do a lot of problem solving but i did most of it in washington in human resources okay um give me a problem and i will find a practical logical solution and mind you, that's not always the optimal solution, because sometimes the optimal solution is impossible to succeed at. So I look for how do you get there as close as you can get to what they want and make a difference in where they're going. Wow. And that in and of itself is what I would call being diplomatic. Hence, now you're in the diplomatic course. So here we are. So your career now has spanned, I would assume, a number of decades, which means you would have seen things change. Uh, You would have seen a greater influx of women in the diplomatic corps. You would have seen a greater influx of women in, in leadership roles. And do you feel like we have come as far as you think we would be at this stage? I don't think there's ever such thing as coming far enough, but do you think we've come as far as you think we should have been at this stage? I think women have made an incredible impact over the last 30 years. Um, I've been in the government over 40 years. When I first came to the government, um, it was very clear that most of the government and a number of big businesses were particularly male-dominated. And every now and then you would see a woman sneak through. Um, But I, I also realized over time and I think more people in senior level jobs realize that the diversity of conversation is very important to any successful business or government agency or whatever. And having people with different backgrounds, different experiences, sitting down in a room and talking about it makes a big difference. I have always found that if I have to make a decision, I will call in a number of people on my team, sit down and talk about it. Because like I say, the differences in opinions, the differences in knowledge. Somebody may know something that I don't know that would impact the decision we're about to make, but I listen to everybody. And in the end, I know as the leader I have to make the final decision, but at least I have more information than I did when I started. Absolutely. But I think women have made a big difference um, coming into the workplace. I think that it, it does lend a different perspective. I did go, I will tell you a short story. When I first came back from what I was a serving at our embassy in Switzerland. And when I came back, I went to work in an office that there were three males in, there was a male director and then he had two division chiefs and I was going to be the deputy. And I went into the first meeting and they were having this conversation about a problem. And I had this very bizarre look on my face, I'm sure. And they said, what's the matter? I said, well, why didn't you consider this, this, and this? And they looked at me and they go, really? I said, you know, so just having people who have different perspectives and different backgrounds coming into a room, it gets everybody thinking in a different way. And I think it's important. I also think that women, just like men, make good leaders. And I think there's been some very effective women throughout the federal government as well as big business. And I think that women have a lot to contribute. Now, in corporate settings these days, you hear a lot more about... the acknowledgement of the importance of using emotional intelligence. Do you think that that has been more so on the rise with the increasing presence of women? I think that, it yes, emotional intelligence has, has obviously become more important in government. But I also think that understanding anyone's feelings is not a great word, but understanding why they believe what they believe or understanding why they feel the way they do is important to solving any problem or or coming to any kind of an agreement. Um, Sometimes there are underlying things that if they're not apparent, you wouldn't know how to respond to the individual. And I think, yes, that dealing with human beings is very important and dealing with their emotions and dealing with the things that are important to them, whether they're obvious or not, makes a much better solution. 
Now, you spoke about something earlier that uh, I also touched on when we uh, conducted our seminar last month, and it's been something that I find has been coming up in conversation, thankfully, a lot more among younger women, and that is mentorship. But they're lamenting that they're not really finding people who are willing to take on the role. What advice would you give to anyone who's been approached and they've been hesitant because they're like, look, I'm no life coach, I'm no expert, I, I can't you know, get you to the stage where you might want to be because I don't want to be responsible for you being derailed in some way. I think the most important thing is to be willing to try. I think that people don't understand that being a mentor does not mean having the answers to everyone's questions or being able to come up with the choices and solutions to someone's problem. It's getting someone to sit down and talk to, you know, the mentee wants someone to talk to. They want someone to sort of be a sounding board and to think of those things that maybe they haven't already thought of and to just listen. And I know when I talk to my mentees, I never tell them what to do. I always say, but have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? What would happen if you did this? What do you think would happen if you did that? Um, the one thing I find with a lot of people as, as mentees, they're afraid to take risk. And you have to walk them through and say, you know, what is the worst thing that can happen? <laughs> um, and a lot of times it's, it's not all that bad what could happen. And I honestly believe the other thing is, is you have to embrace failure. So you don't yell at anybody if they don't succeed. You don't criticize them. You just say, okay, let's talk about how it went well, and let's talk about what didn't go so well and how do we improve it the next time so it doesn't happen again. But you have to be open-minded You, as a mentor. You have to be willing to sit down and listen carefully to what someone's saying, and you need to give advice, not answers. You need to be able to say, think about this or think about that or try this or try that. But you can't tell somebody how to run their career or their life. Now, see, that sounds a lot less intimidating. So maybe somebody else is like, oh, thank goodness, because I did not have the answer <laughs> for whatever they were asking me. And I was afraid to say, yeah, you should totally go left. <laughs> so that's that's an actually far more useful answer for somebody to say, OK, well, maybe maybe I can approach this again and, and be of some sort of help to this individual. So, like I said, you've had many years in not only the, the service, you've seen a lot of things, you've been a lot of places, but if tomorrow you decided, okay, I'm ready for a change in career or just a change in lifestyle altogether, what would you be doing? You know, when I started out in college, I started out in education. I was an education major. And slowly but surely I realized that I wanted to do something different. But I think now I want to go back to the school. I want to be able to work with young children, work with them on reading math problems. Um, if I can teach anyone about government, um, the world, talk to them about what goes on in the world and politics and all of that. But I would like to continue to give back and go back into the education field. Yeah, so it's not going to stop for you, really. It's just going to change a little bit, change the focus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, teaching teaching is very rewarding. I mean, even at any level, it's very, very rewarding. And so what do you do in your spare time if they allow you such a thing, uh, spare time when you're not doing radio interviews at 930 in the morning? <laughs> you know, um, I enjoy um, entertaining because I enjoy having a diverse group of people at my home. Um, I enjoy good, lively conversation, um, some of it political, some of it just fun and talking. I enjoy all of the opportunities that are afforded here in Barbados. I love the Animal Flower Cave. I love to go to, out to the, the beaches. Um, anything that, like AgroFest or the Expo for the Girlfriends Expo, things mm -hmm. that I can meet Bayesian people and get to know people um, and learn about the cultures and the, the people. So I think um, I just like to relax and enjoy my time and to get out and be around people. That is fantastic. And do you have any final words for the people who are out there listening, thinking, oh, I never knew this lady before? <laughs> well, no, I'd like to say that, you know, the United States government is a true partner to the United States and the people of the United States are true partners to the people of Barbados and the Barbados government. We want to build a partnership with them to deal with the issues that we have in common to work with them on the issues that they have concerns for, and to be able to help bring 
the government, to, or not the government, but the people of Barbados a better understanding of who we are, what we are, and what we want to do to help them. And I just want to uh, let you know that a couple of weeks ago, I was uh, honored to be invited to a meeting. And there are a couple of things we have in the pipeline. That's all I can say right now. But I think it, you're going to find them very, very interesting, Barbados, and a way that you can forge uh, energies and efforts and really move yourselves forward in whatever your chosen field. I, th there's some th exciting things happening. And sometimes it's just to have the medium, like this, uh, to help people know that it's available. So... Well, the other thing, too, you know, we, we do have a Facebook page. Mm -hmm. We do have a Twitter account. Um, we have a WhatsApp. We have a brand-new WhatsApp number. Um, it's 246-230-5097. Um, I invite you all to look at one of those social medias and be able to reach out to us because um, we have a lot of good information. We talk about what we do here in Barbados as well as the other Eastern Caribbean countries. Um, but you would be surprised at the number of things we get ourselves involved in. Absolutely. So we invite you to do that as of now. So that would be awesome. And um, that way you can be able to stay ahead of some of the initiatives that are going to be happening later this year. And if one actually appeals to you in a big way, reach out now so you can get ahead and definitely take part in what's available. Because sometimes there's just all kinds of opportunities. People just don't know where to start looking. This is a great place to start. And I will um, definitely reiterate where you can find them on Facebook, Twitter, as well as WhatsApp with the brand new number, which is 246-230-5097. Don't worry. We're going to add you to our board. That's what we're going to do. We're going to add you to our board right there. And that way we're going to be uh, in the know. So as things come up, we will we'll be able to, to share with our people as well. Uh, any final words? Thank you very much for having me today. Um, I look forward to the We Gathering events as the year Absolutely. goes on. Mm -hmm. And obviously, I look forward because I come from New York State, and there's a large diaspora of Caribbean people in New York City. Yep. And we have a very active congressman, Congressman Elliot Engel, who's very interested in the diaspora. We will be participating and sharing all through the year. This is going to be some awesome stuff. It's going to be a great year ahead, believe you me. So thank you so much, Ambassador. Uh, thank you to your team, making sure they've come in. A special good morning going out to Leland. And, of course, a special good morning going out to Quain. And Lisa, I know you're out there listening as well. And Samantha, you guys have yourselves a wonderful day. Larry, I haven't forgotten you either. Have yourself a wonderful day as well.